Well, I'm Jerry Phillips, and I'm the son of the legendary Sam Phillips, and we're at uh, Sam Phillips Recording Studio in Memphis at 639 Madison Avenue. You know, my dad really was the most unique individual that I've ever run into. He was on his own mission, no matter what he was trying to accomplish, whether it was music or radio or, or just trimming his hedges. I mean, he had, a, he had a style about him that was very focused and dedicated in anything that, that he would do. And anybody that you'd want on your team, it'd be, it'd be Sam Phillips. He, he's going he's gonna to outwork you and he's going to outthink you and uh, he's, he's going to win. Growing up around my house, uh, there was a couple of different houses, but when we moved, I was born here in Memphis, but my dad moved here in 1945, and he got into the, he was in the radio business. He had he started in radio in, in Muscle Shoals, Alabama, and moved to Decatur, Alabama in radio, then to Nashville, and then to Memphis. That's kind of how you, it happens in radio, you know, you work your way up. He got to Memphis at WRC and he had to, he mixed all the big bands at the Peabody Skyway that would come through. And the sky was a beautiful place at the top of the Peabody where all these big bands came through and be big dances up there and all that. And he was one of the guys that did the mixing for the for the uh, networks. They were broadcasting and stuff in the networks. And a lot of those band guys kept asking him, Why, how, how are you making it sound so much different than everybody else? He was... Uh, mixing the rhythm section up, you know, the guitar and the drums and all that, and putting the rest of the stuff around, the horns and strings and all that stuff around there. Before he moved out of Sun and over to here, uh, the only time we could see our father was my brother and I, Knox, was when my mother took us to the studio, because he was always gone. I mean, he was always working. He'd go to the radio station in the morning at 7, get off at 3.30, come to the studio, work at 3.30 to whenever, and go back. And... Uh, to the recording studio. So we, we were around the Sun Studio, which was actually Memphis Recording Service. It never was Sun Studio, you know, that, that was that came later. Kind of a touristy name, which is a cool name, but Sun Records was housed in Memphis Recording Service. So we got to see a lot of recording at, at a very young age and were very influenced by, you know, the, the black artists that, that were coming through there and the 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 non-racial vibrations that were coming off my father and at a time when it was very racial here in Memphis, Tennessee. So it was great. And then when he when he actually made some money, you know, became successful and outgrew the Sun Studio and started building on this place uh, and bought a new house, you know, and uh, it really, things really started popping really good when with the Elvis thing. That's, of course, a, a, a well-known story, but with the Elvis situation being so successful and him selling his contract for 35000 plus 5000 that he owed Elvis, which it, in 1954, that was a lot of money. It was probably the equivalent of $300,000 today or more or so. He was rolling pretty good there, and he bought a really nice house in, uh, in East Memphis. And those guys would come over to our house quite frequently, especially Elvis. He'd come over there a lot, and he would always be after midnight or right around midnight because he was Elvis Presley in the 50s and 60s. I mean, he, he really could not get out. You know, uh, he would be kind of mobbed by girls pulling his hair out and his clothes off, and he, he was stripped down naked probably, yeah, you know, yeah. if he could get a hold of him. But, yeah, he'd come over, man, and he brought some of the most beautiful women I've ever seen in my life. And I was old enough to recognize, well, you know, that that situation. They just were enamored by him. And he'd always have a, 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 a group of people with him that were cool. All the guys were cool, all the girls. It was so easy to get a date if you said, hey, you want to go hang out with Elvis Presley, you know, at Sam Phillips' house or wherever it was going to be. It was easy. And these guys all had good-looking girls with them, too, you know. My parents were really cool. They would know Elvis would call and say, hey, we're going to drop by. And my brother and I might be in bed already to get up to go to school the next day. And they would wake us up and say, oh, Elvis is coming over. You guys want to get up and, you know, I miss school tomorrow. You know, of course, the answer to that was yes. And so they always included us in what they were doing, unlike a lot of parents who would probably say, you guys, you know, stay in your room or whatever. But 
But they, they really did. They, they included us, and I think my dad had a, a reason for doing that, you know, because I definitely learned more about hanging around that scene than I would have learned going to school the next day, you know. So it was a very, very, very great upbringing at, after, at, a, at a certain point in time when there was a little money involved because he started off with really nothing, you know, to built everything in his own studio over there at Sun and built his own speaker cabinets and he was working with, you know, one track and about six microphones at the most. So he he was, uh, but he was able to do that, you know, sound was his thing and uh, he knew how to get it. But to answer your question about my childhood, it was just very, very, I don't have anything but really great memories about, about my childhood, you know. I'm a guitar player mainly, and uh, my brother gave me my first guitar when I was 12. It was a small Gibson, a uh, really small body Gibson, and I uh, played in bands all through high school and in my early 20s and mid-20s, and music has always been something I loved, and, you know, girls always like guitar players, you know, that's that's the reason a lot of people get in music business is for the, the ladies, but, and I can play some piano too, but I probably wouldn't hire myself on a session for piano playing, but I, I do, when I go out and perform, I do play some piano, but mostly guitar, you know. I had a band called The, the Jesters, which actually had a, a Sun record out, one of the last Sun records that was ever released, uh, Sun number 400, and it was a band I was in called The Jesters, and then I had a couple other bands, you know, as a, a lot younger days, The Escapades, and uh, um, the Boogaloo Boys, and you know, a bunch of different crazy names of people, and different different groups of people, but yeah, I played in a lot of different bands, and uh, uh, we, the Jesters were a band that came along in the mid '60s, and um, we, unlike most bands in town or around the country, we really weren't playing Beatle music or English influenced music. We were playing blues and rock and roll and rockabilly, and we, we that's really what we liked to do. And I, I'm a big fan of the Beatles also, but we our music was not you know uh, English invasion type influenced. It was uh, blues and rockabilly and that kind of thing. So. Yeah, man, I love playing. I'm still playing. I'm still writing songs, and uh, I still perform occasionally. I'm going to Spain here in February to Rockabilly Festival over there. And so, yeah, I love it, man. It's just great. It really is. When I was playing in bands, it was mostly like, you know, around, we, I mean, we would go to Arkansas and Mississippi and played all the you know, the fraternity dances around Memphis, we played a lot, you know, everybody, we booked about every weekend. And then I had a group that I was in called Jimmy Day in the Nights, and we had a horn section, a vocal section, three-piece singers, horns. We played rhythm and blues. All we did was play rhythm and blues, you know, even into like the, you know, the four tops and just all kinds of stuff like that. We had great singers, great players. And so, yeah, I've been a part of a bunch of different types of bands, but mostly they're, they've been rooted in, in the, you know, kind of like the stuff my dad uh, kind of started out recording, the blues and the Alan Wolf stuff and then the rockabilly and the Elvis. But, you know, I, I, if I do somebody else's song or something, you know, I, I do my own version of it. I don't, I don't try to cover the original because you can't beat, you know, the original so. Well, I try. I know it, in the club bands, you kind of have to do that sometimes, but I'm to the point now where I, I, I tell everybody, hey, man, this is my version of this song because I can't beat, you know, Jerry Lee's version or I can't beat, uh, you know, Jim Dickinson's singing or, you know, I can't beat it. So my dad always said, you need to do something different, you know, and, and I don't know that he made up this quote, but it was, you might as well be yourself because everybody else is taken, you know, so, so that, that always stuck with me, you know, really big and I, I still still believe that when I talk to people about music as you know he always said man you know you gotta reach way down inside yourself and and and, uh, and get it out of there and one of the funniest stories we were at a, a party one night we'd all been kind of drinking my dad my brother and I and there was I don't remember exactly who the band was it was an English a very famous English band that was in town and and uh, the manager came up to my dad and says, Mr. Phillips, he goes, uh, what, what's the secret of rock and roll, you know? And uh, my dad looked at him really straight in the eyes and says, well, son, he said, uh, you got to reach way down deep inside yourself and pull it out of your asshole. And I've always thought that was, you know, I always thought that was a good, real get to the point 
what rock and roll music is all about. You know, you can't just halfway go get it. You got to go get it. And you got to give yourself, not what you think people want to hear or whatever. Sam was always after this, his artist's soul, you know, and he had a unique ability to, to get that out of those people, that bring more out of them than they thought were even possible to get out of them, you know. So I still use that phrase about to pull it out of your asshole uh, with a lot of people, because I know it's kind of brash, but it really explains, at least to me, the definition of, you know, being yourself and just, if you're in here, man, if you're in the studio or whatever you're doing, you know, let's, let's, let's go for it, you know. Don't be afraid to make a mistake, you know. If you make a mistake. He left, he left so many mistakes in his records, it wasn't even funny. Like he said, them all, he was after perfect imperfection. He didn't want anything perfect, you know. And, and I don't either, you know, in the stuff I'm doing, I don't, I don't want it to be perfect. Uh, it has to have some kind of magic if it's too perfect or too rehearsed. There's not any magic in there anymore, you know. It's just rehearsed. I guess I'm real close to the fire and can, there's been so much um, untruths out there about about this whole, how all this all came about and right. people taking credit for different things that really they didn't need to take credit for. But, you know, I, I like, you know, giving my perspective on it because I was really, really there, you know, pretty much right. for a lot of it. The misconception in the general public is that uh, any of this was easy, you know, that... Uh, Elvis just walked into the studio and then all of a sudden he's a smash hit, you know. And, and Elvis was not the only thing that was super great about what my dad did. I mean, all that blues stuff before Elvis even got to the picture was awesome, awesome recordings. And, you know, when, keeping in mind it's 1950, okay, and there's, there's a white man who has a recording studio and then he's looking for black artists. And you could go in there for free and record. And if he liked what he heard, he'd put a record out on you. Now, it took, it took quite a bit of convincing to a lot of black folks then that, that this, that we're, where's the hook? You know what I mean? There's got to be a hook. This white guy really can't be. I mean, he's going to screw us up somehow. I mean, that just was the mentality of what was going on in those days. But... He, he, that's not what he was really trying to save a type of music, you know, the gut bucket blues and that kind of stuff and give people a chance that weren't going to get a chance. I mean, they, they just weren't going to get a chance. And if they got a chance, they were probably going to get, you know, uh, cheated out of their money or not paid at all. And, and uh, so he was very aware of that. And uh, all that spilt over into every artist that he dealt with. And then, you know, when Elvis came into the situation, Elvis was a big fan of all the stuff he had recorded blues-wise, you know, because Dewey Phillips was playing that stuff. Dewey was a disc jockey on WHBQ Radio here. No relation to Sam, but they had the same last name, and they became really great friends. And uh, Elvis was very familiar with Howlin' Wolf and Ike Turner and, you know, Jackie Brinston and Rocket 88. And, in fact, you know, his first record was That's All Right, Mama, which was... Arthur Big Boy Crudup song, a black card song. So they had a kinship, you know, there with the music, you know, that they liked. And that combination, Sam Phillips and Elvis Presley, was a barrier, racially barrier, breaking down radio cross. I mean, it was uh, black people are only getting played on black radio stations and white, no, and white people only get played on white radio stations at that particular time. And when Elvis, and that synthesis came about. It opened the, it blew the doors open, man, for for black artists to get on white radio stations. It really did, and uh, changed the culture of the world. It truly really did. I mean, it, it, I don't know that a lot of younger people that today really realize, you know, what a big step forward that was for mankind, <laughs> yeah. like going to the moon or something. But it really was, and you know, people. Uh, Rejected Elvis a lot. My dad was on the road about 70,000 miles a year in his car. He would record the stuff, master it, take it to the pressing plants, pick it up. My brother and I would help him load some of these records in the back of his trunk and we'd say goodbye to him and he'd be gone for a week or two. 
on the road, and he'd stop at every radio tower that he saw and go in and say, man, you know, can you help me on this record? And a lot of people just didn't like Elvis, you know, didn't know what to think about him. And and uh, it was tough. He was about to give up, and as a matter of fact, and going broke, too, when he was promoting Elvis. And uh, he told me the story of how he took Elvis on the road with him one time to, this was 1954 when the record was first coming out, and to these radio stations, some of the, some of the white radio stations would not let Elvis use the bathroom, you know, because they just thought he was too greasy looking and uh, he was uh, a lover of that other kind of music, you know. So he, it was a fight. I mean, it was a real fight to get that stuff done. But once it, uh, once it took hold, you know, it, it really, it really, it really took off. And then he, he was about, he was about to go bankrupt, really. I mean, if you. If you had a record up, going up the charts, say like Elvis's record, and the distributors were only paying you, record distributors were paying you every ninety days, and you know that's ninety days you got no money coming in, you, but you need more records, you need to pre have money to press more records, and uh, so he was running out of money, you know, and that was one of the reasons that uh, they sold Elvis's contract was to stay in business. Well, you know, he had a radio console. He was familiar with radio boards, you know, and uh, he had taken a a course, Alabama Polytechnical Institute, which was, a, was, was an arm of um, Auburn, and I believe it was a correspondence course. You know, I don't, I don't believe that he went to Auburn to school, but he couldn't do that. His dad died when he was real young, so he was working, you know, uh, in high school and all that to support his mother and his deaf mute aunt, but he got he uh, he got some education on in, on the technical aspect of, of recording, and uh, he just scraped together his money, and uh, you know bought a used RCA six input console or whatever it was with the big knobs, you know, and a mono tape machine and probably I don't know four or five microphones, you know, built his own speakers. I may have already said this, but he built his own speakers. And, and uh, it was a shoestring operation, man. But he was living off of passion, you know. It's what he wanted to do. And <laughs> this is really amazing to me. Actually, he has, a, he has a pretty good job at this point in time when he opened the studio at WRAC, you know, radio. And uh, But he was working like 18, 20 hours a day. So... And the studio at that particular time was really not making him any money to so, so to speak of. So he comes home one day and tells my mother, "Hey, both these things are too much. I, I've got to let one of them go." And so naturally, you'd think he would let the studio go and keep his salary paying job, but that's not what he wanted to do. He let his paying job go kept the studio with no income, basically. I mean, he had some income. He was recording weddings and funerals and stuff like that. But I would say my mother doesn't give enough credit for the creation of rock and roll because she could have said, are you crazy? We've got two kids here. We just moved to Memphis. We, we you know, uh, you, and you're going to quit your job that's paying you to record black artist on a, on a, total gamble and but she didn't she says well you know whatever you want to do we'll stand behind you and we'll we got all the faith in the world in you and and Sam Phillips needed that and any any man or anybody on a hacking his way through the jungle you know needs some support from home and she supported him all the way I mean so much it's unbelievable Yeah, but you know what? I don't. I don't ever remember it being. My mother was such an angelic figure. Honestly, I don't ever remember. Uh, and we didn't have a, a lot of money or anything like that. We really didn't. I don't ever remember wanting for anything, or at least my mother camouflaged it to where we didn't know that we needed anything. If we did, you know, and it's a it's a remarkable story, man. It really is. It's a world changing story. You know, he made some pretty good money with Elvis Jerry Lee and Johnny Cash and Carl Perkins, you know, he was, in fact, he was, 
when he built this studio, which he started in 1958, started building, this was a Midas muffler shop, and he completely gutted it. But at that particular time, he was the hottest record producer in the world, if you, if you look back on that time frame, you know. So he started working on this place in 1958 and opened in 1960. But he built his dream studio, you know, uh, two, two studio rooms, Studio A, Studio B, two mastering lathes, three analog echo chambers, offices on the second floor for promotion men, salespeople, the whole thing for independent record label, third floor, penthouse suite, his office, a bar, cool bar, man. <laughs> you know, it's, we still use that thing a lot. But uh, that, in 1960, it opened, and we've been, we've been going, you know, strong. I say strong, we, there's been some times when we weren't as strong because the record business changed, you know, and it's always changing and evolving, but still in business 50, 60 years later, and yet you're here, you know, which is awesome. He spent three quarters of a million dollars, by the way, in 1959, 60 for, to build this place. So it, it, and anything, everything in here is custom built, you know, furniture, all that, all custom, custom made. He really built this place to be a, a, a recording facility for anybody that wanted to come here and record. You know, he, he was, his focus had changed from, from actually the record business because he saw the handwriting on the wall for independence. I mean, the major labels were buying up all the distributors. And, I mean, you know, he, he saw, he, he was a visionary cat. You know, he really was. He saw this all coming, man, that the independence went a hard, hard time. And, uh, in fact, he tried to, he, 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 uh, formed this thing called Armada, which was a, it was a, a, a group of, of uh, independent record labels that he was trying to put all together so they could have a unified force to kind of fight the major labels, you know. But he, he just couldn't get everybody on board, you know, to do that. So he just basically said, you know, I'm, I'm, unless I'm going to do what I did when I started Sun Record, which is, you know, just totally dedicate my life to being on the road, to being, you know, promoting, you know, that's what it took, you know, to do it. And it still takes that for an independent record company today to do anything. So he started really focusing on publishing, song publishing, and this the studio here. And we stayed real busy, man. My brother and I did majority of, I say majority, we had Scotty Moore was here. I, I was an engineer. My brother was an engineer. We did a lot of engineering producing uh, here out of the studio and, he built a facility that he hoped that anybody anywhere could come and record and get a state-of-the-art recording out of it, you know. Best experiences on recording were when you would say, hey, guys, let's run this thing down. You know, they're not thinking they're recording at all. They're just running it down. And they're, they're loose. They're willing to stick, step out there on a limb and make a mistake. You know, but as soon as you say we're rolling, everybody tightens up, man. They tighten up, and and uh, it, it's a different, it's a different type of music. I mean, it's close, it's similar, you know. But the magic happens when when you get way out there, man, and know you could fall off at any minute. But that's where that's where for me that's where the that's where it happens. The really good stuff, you know. My brother and I both started off uh, keeping the tape logs, which then what you do, you sit in there and if you started a song and it got a false start, you know, the tape would continue to run, but you'd write, you know, I love you, baby, whatever type of song, a false start, FS, false start, and, then the, and, and you'd keep the tape log. So when you were looking for the cut that you liked, you could take this tape log and go back and find it on the tape machine. And, and so that's kind of how we started and observing, you know, uh, what he was doing. And then, uh, of course, we just got really interested in it and started working with our own uh, bands that were our age people and producing, you know, records. On, you know, a lot, of, a lot of things we produced that never got released. I mean, that's just the way it is, you know. Uh, we both, my brother and I, Knox, we both uh, 
that's kind of how we got started. And like I said, I started on a three track machine, which was the state of the art. That was man when we, when we got an eight track machine. And I'm, I'm dating myself here, I guess. But when we got an eight track machine, thought, man, how are we gonna, how are we gonna fill up all these tracks? And then when sixteen came, we went, man, this is unbelievable, you know what you can do now. But uh, that's kind of how we started. And he he uh, he give us some pointers, you know. But it was it was mainly about you know. Don't call any attention to the microphones, you know, because it's psychology. He he always claimed there's a lot of psychology in, in record production, and there is. Putting people at ease, making them feel like it's okay to make a mistake, you know, we'll, we'll just do it again, you know. And, and, and once you get people loosened up, man, they'll, they'll, they'll give you stuff. But I, I kind of got off your question there about how we, we got in it, but that's basically it. We just, we observed and worked. Uh, I brought my bands in here. In fact, my brother was one of the first ones to record my bands, you know, and that's how he kind of learned. And then he he, uh, he he did a lot of other stuff too. I mean, we all did. You know, we we could so many people recorded here from 1960 till till now. You know, was uh, and I'm not really an active engineer anymore because. <laughs> Man, that's a young guy's game, and I'm not getting old, real old or nothing. But you know, you stay in the studio 12, 14 hours a day, you know, working on, and you cut 12 or 15 songs, and you're, you've been there a couple of weeks, and you know, you cut the tracks, and you got to back and overdub the voice, and the voices, and the guitar breaks, and everything. That's if you're not cutting live, but I mean, it's a grind. I think most people don't really realize how hard a work it is to record music. It's just like what you're doing with me right now. Every film crew I've ever seen, hardest working people I've ever seen on the tightest, hardest schedule, long hours, man, you know, to get a final product after editing, after, I mean, it's it's just, I just think the general public doesn't really have a, any idea what, what goes on. It, it's work, you know, but you love it at the same time, you know. Now, me, these days, if I'm recording something, I get everybody in the studio at once. I'm not going to overdub for six, ten hours. You know, I'm just not going to do it. I'm going to get, we're going to play. If I want a horn player, I want a horn player to be in there. I want a vocalist, a, a backup singer, I want to be in there. You know, and, and let's just go for it, you know. It, it, because then, it, then it's fun, it's not work. This other stuff's kind of work, man. You know, it's tough. Yeah. It is. It really is. In the days of the singles and everything, you know, I mean, and the independent labels particularly, they were building artists. So in other words, if, they put, if you put a record out and it sold 20,000, wow, it sold 20,000 records, maybe we can sell 50,000 on the next time. And in, this, in the process, you're building an artist's career, you know, whereas today, I know a lot of people that are in Nashville, and Nashville's a wonderful town. It's the greatest, greatest musicians in the world there. But, I mean, you know, if you get a record deal and your first record doesn't do really pretty good, you probably won't get that second chance for your second album, you know. And if your second album flops, you're, you're done. You know, I mean, I'm not saying I'm the guru of the music business because that may not be what everybody thinks, but I don't, I don't see a lot of effort going into building artists' career, you know, hanging with them, you know, hanging with them till they get to a point where they really are, you know, big, big stars. Pretty in and out for for you. And, uh, you know, the, the idea that there's so many people that sound alike, too, it's hard to distinguish, you know, who's who these days. But one, every once in a while, somebody will come along, there's no doubt when he opens his mouth, you know, that who that is singing. And, you know, with Sam Phillips and all his artists, it was immediate. Jerry Lee opened his mouth, you know, who he was. Elvis, you know, who he was. Johnny Cash, you know, who he was. Carl Perkins, you know, who he was. Charlie Rich, you know, Roy Orbison. You didn't, you weren't saying, well, now, is that Roy Orbison or is that uh, Conway Twitty? Or, you know, I mean, it, it wasn't that kind of deal. It was an instant recognition. And I, I, don't, I don't hear a lot of that today of real people that have their own distinctive style because I think, and I, like I said, I'm not as active in the music business as in the record business as I used to be, but, you know, if 
if a, if somebody has a big hit like Garth Brooks, let's just say, or Tim McGraw, or whoever it might be today, Keith Urban, or whatever, and it's no different when my dad was in business. Uh, the other record companies, if, if if say, let's just use Keith Urban's so, I mean, He's great. I love Keith Urban. Say he's got a sound, he's selling the hell out of everything. The other labels kind of want their Keith Urban, and things start sounding alike. They start saying, well, this is this is what's selling, so we need to get that. And when Sam was doing Elvis, you know, all of a sudden there was Ricky Nelson, uh, the other label, Fabian, Bobby Darren, all these all these different guys, you know, that became uh, Elvis. Th- those that record come to attempt to have their Elvis. And it, it's still going on t- t- today, which, I mean, I think it's a... It's an okay thing. Sure. You know, they're just trying to make money and sell records, and that's that's what they're supposed to be doing. You know? If you're an artist and you sign the label, you want them to help you sell records or whatever they think they need to do to do that. But, and none of this I'm saying is critical. Of, it's not critical of anything. It's just my opinion. We did pay attention to people that were competing, but, you know, uh, when you were dealing with other independent labels. I mean, you kind of had an affinity for what they were trying to do. Made them the, the really the ones that were, were were trying to steal the thunder were the majors. You know, I mean, they were the ones that were putting out the Ricky Nelsons, and uh, they were trying to get their Elvis. You know, and it, it really wasn't the independents. I mean, there was some independents doing it. Don't get me wrong, but but it was uh, it was uh, main, mainly the majors that that uh, that would they were actually. Stealing artists from people, you know what I'm talking about? The independents would, well, the independents would, would discover these people, you know, build them up, make their music, and then then uh, the, these corporations would find out when their contracts are up and send a, a lawyer down or something to secretly meet with them and say, you know, we can we can offer you a better deal. You know, we can offer you a better deal than Sam Phillips or or Jerry Wexler or you know whoever else independent wise can probably offer you. And, it's, you know, if you're an artist, you go, wow, man, you know, sounds pretty good to me, you know. And, you know, my dad always said, you know, these artists will lead you to the cliff and shove you off if somebody makes them a better deal. They'll forget that, that they were nothing when they came to you and that the, all the things you did for them. And that's not across the board, but... but that's a lot of truth in that. And you can't really blame the artists for that. I mean, they're trying to build a career. And if there's a big company that's going to put, or claiming to want to put more money behind them, and, and they're telling them, well, you know, this little record company here, they can only do so much for you, man, you know. So come on. Come over. And I don't know. I, I'm probably making enemies all over the world with these statements, but I'm, I'm just not really sure what, what, big corporate major labels. I mean, maybe today it's better, but what they really contributed as far as getting into the laboratory, which my dad always called the studio a laboratory, like I added to that, it's like a like building a Frankenstein. You you get in there, you put the parts together, you try to bring it to life. If it ever starts walking, you got something, you know. But uh, I, I don't know the major label situation, whether they're really discovering new, great, developing raw talent, you know? And that may be an old idea, you know? But, boy, it's a good one, though, man. And, you know, when a Willie Nelson or, a, you know, a Waylon Jennings or somebody breaks the mold, they, they always go straight to the top, man. And then that, then that circle starts again. We got to have our Willie. We got to have our Waylon. We got to have our, you know, our deal. And so, you know, like I said, these are all just my opinions. And and I'm not the most successful guy that's ever lived in the music business, believe me. But uh, just, you know, it's not all about selling records. It is not all about singer, but it's not about all about selling records. You know, it's about what you what kind of music you're making, and hopefully. You know, my dad, he wanted to make money, of course, but he wanted to get the music first, you know, and so that's the way I feel about it. You know, I don't think so because, like I said, it, it was a it was a deal where the majors were making it pretty impossible to uh, to do the things that the independents could do at one time do because they. When it, when the independent labels first started, 
at least this is my understanding of it. The majors just kind of thought, you know, that's, those little guys down there in the south, you know, they're, they're, they're not going to be able to do much. You know, we, we ain't got to really worry about those guys. But they did have to worry about them, you know, and, and it, it, was, it was proof of Elvis and all those guys. I mean, it just, it was something that they really couldn't do, you know, and, and they all left some. And I mean, it, it, they were, you know, coached to do it. Some of them had reasons to do it. And my dad was a one-man operation, basically. I mean, he turned. He had some people that worked for him, eventually Jack Clement and different ones to do that stuff. But some of the people, I know, for example, Billy Lee Riley had, and people, young people don't know who I'm talking about, but he had a record on the charts. I think it was Flying Saucer Rock and Roll. And I think Great Balls of Fire on Jerry Lee Lewis was out there at the same time. Or one of those songs. I'm not exactly sure I'm telling the, the two songs. But the Jerry Lee Lewis record was outperforming, you know, the Billy Lee Riley record. And so my dad had to take most of his resources and put it into the Jerry Lee Lewis record. And it really hacked Billy Riley off, you know. And you can understand that. Cause he, and Billy went through the rest of his life thinking that Sam didn't didn't help his career. I mean, he, he, he dropped him, you know. It was just sort of true and it's sort of not true, but you know, you have to make a decision at some point in time if you if, if you don't have the resources that you need to, to promote three or four different arts at a time. So, but most people that are on Sun, man, they, they, don't, they don't have any hard feelings, you know, about anything. Uh, and uh, my dad and all those people they had lawsuits, they had everything, but they all came out friends in the end, you know, loved each other, because they went through some different stuff together. We went through a, a down period, I mean, when, when all this new technology came in, into being, and where you could take a Pro Tools rig and go in your basement and cut an album, the, the, the use for a big studio, and all that stuff kind of went away, and 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 record companies dropped their budgetary. You used to get two or three hundred fifty, three hundred thousand dollars to do an album on somebody. I mean, it was a lot of money there. So, over the years, we've had to change our focus a little bit, you know, to, to publishing and that kind of thing. And I have to say, I got burned out on the music biz. I worked for Stax and for uh, Shelter Records. I worked for, you know, had a couple of labels that I tried to start that didn't really do much. But, but you know, I call it shelf music. I got a lot of shelf music. It's just on the shelf and never, never went anywhere, you know, because it's just so hard to get it. But I have to give my daughter credit, Hallie. She's 32 now. And she really was on me about... Uh, you know, we need to, we need to, we never close or anything, but we need to rethink about, you know, what what we're doing at the studio. And I said, well, you know, like a good dad would say, you don't want to get in this business. <laughs> you know what I mean? But she's very persistent and she's very good at it. But she really is, is what brought Matt Rothstein over here, you know, the new young guys that are two Grammy Award winning. And then through Matt, Jeff Powell came, you know, and, uh, just the new, the newer, younger generation, which I really do give my daughter a lot of credit. I, I don't know that I would have really ever got, you know, back, really geared back up to try to really, you know, do anything other than what we were doing, which was, you know, doing some sessions and contrary on our publishing companies. But, but I give her a lot of credit for it. And it's fantastic, man, to have a, a daughter that's, that's, willing to carry on the the uh, you know, the legacy thing. And I know my dad and I used to argue all the time. And I, I now understand when I was arguing with him about different stuff and, he, and then I would I would go off and leave the family and get a job and, you know, work at a truck line or something. Because I didn't want to be known as the son of Sam Phillips, you know, and all this stuff. At the time, I didn't really realize what what I was doing was not really... You know, realizing what he had done, and that for for me to like say I'm not really going to interested in this and what you've done, we'll do something else. I mean, it, that's pretty hard to take. I, I realize now that I got daughters because I know now if, if 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 Hallie 
would not have been involved, you know, and wanted to carry all this on, uh, it, I would have been, been disappointed, you know. And my brother Knox, he, uh, he's been real ill over the last three years, but he, he was the consummate music professional in Memphis. I mean, music politician, music record producer. He, did, he got the nearest chapter here. I mean, he did so many things. He got every kind of award you can possibly get in the music business, and he got real sick. And um, uh, I, I can't leave him out of this scenario because he he ran his place while I was off running around doing different things. Because I went in the army for just a little while, and uh, uh, he was here. He he never he never he never gave up or never. Said he wasn't going to do it, and and he if you wanted to talk to my dad for every, years and years, you had to go through Knox. You know, he was kind of like his personal manager and and, and all of that stuff. My brother Knox was, was just like me. He learned in the studio to be an engineer and everything, but he he uh, uh, they won a Grammy with Amazing Rhythm Aces that he produced. He did the Gentries. He did a lot of stuff with Mike Post, who, who did, did all the music for Rockford Files and TV music, did a lot of stuff. He's just done a lot of different things, and, and a lot of his stuff was political in, in, in the, you know, the, music, the politics of music. He'd be, he'd be in L.A., you know, trying to set things up, and he just he would, and he would give some of these blues artists money to pay their, their utility bills with them. He was, Knoxville was just a guy that you could go to for help anytime you wanted it. And he was a great record producer and a great person and very dedicated to his craft. And uh, he got the Naris chapter here, which is the Grammy Award, you know, voting Grammy chapter. He actually got it here. He went out and fought like crazy. There was a several cities that were trying to get that chapter when they were developing these chapters. And he used to ask anybody in Memphis who, who was responsible for getting that. Grammy chapter, and, and there's some other people involved too. But my brother was a very major player and all that. And he was a political science major in college, so I mean, he kind of knew knew about the politics of everything. But he he was a very good uh, music guy too. And but boy, critical as hell. I mean, critical as hell. He, he, his style of producing was like, come on, man, you can do better than that shit. That that sounds awful. Let's do it again. Let's do it again. He had, he had a different abrasive style of producing, which is different from mine. But but. Uh, uh, he, he's a great guy, man. Really, I really miss his participation in, in the studio. He misses it, too. You know, He got cancer 25 years ago, but then all the radiation he had to take and everything had messed up his throat. And, and um, he just, in, you know, it's not, not very good shape. But, but, you know, he did a great job. You know, there's so many different aspects of that answer, but... It goes back to being yourself, you know, pulling it out of your asshole, <laughs> and you know, uh, being satisfied with what you got, you know, what you're able to give, and not necessarily go down that path of uh, I want to sound like this guy. I mean, it's just I know I'm not giving you a very definitive answer, but I just think it's a really about doing something different. You know, you just need to do something different, man. You know, it's just, that's what I would say to them, you know. And I've got the saying that I made up, is when you're in the studio, you're not playing for the tape machine, you're playing for the universe. The tape machine just remembers it for you. And so that kind of frees you up to experiment and, uh, you know, be yourself and let it go, man. Just let it go. And uh, that's not going to always be the most successful route, I can tell you that. It's really not going to be. But uh, when you're laying on your nursing home bed, you'll be thinking, man, you know, I did it. I did the way I wanted to do it. And, you know, I don't regret it. I don't regret that I didn't sell out for a couple of years, you know, to make a little money. But you gotta have money, but we, this life's gonna come to an end sometime. And, you know, it's what you've kind of done, you know, that's gonna matter. Business advice? Don't get in. <laughs> no, I don't mean it. I don't know, man. It's just, it's just hard work, man. You know, the business aspect of it, the music business. 
that's what we forget sometimes, you know. Uh, it's fun to play, it's fun to do all that, but it boils down to the business side of things, you know. If you care about it, if you care about it, making money or, or, or the business, that's what it boils down to. It, it shifts gears from creativity to business, and then you have to be creative in the business side too, but it's, uh, it's a business like anything else at that point. Like I said, I got all the shelf music. You know, the, the business plan didn't work, and there's a lot of people got the same issues. You know, all of us got the same issues. Everything doesn't work, you know. But the music's still great, man. You know. Well, you know, man, I'm doing a lot of songwriting these days, and I'm doing, when it comes to music, if it's not fun for me now, I'm not interested in even doing it, you know, and uh, Jack Clement said, and he's a, he was one of the first guys my dad ever hired, but he, he got, he produced Charlie Pride and all kinds of bunch of stuff, but you know, he said, if it's not fun, we don't need to be doing this, and so music is fun, you know, but boy, it can get to be unfun quick, you know, and it's a very sensitive thing, artists are very sensitive, and you know, uh, they wear the feelings on their shoulders, and, and um, it's just, uh, if it, it, that's for me, if it's not fun, I'm just not going to do it. But I'm, I've got a little studio in my house on, on the Tennessee River, and, you know, I do my demos there. Most of them I do them there because it's just so relaxed. I get on my boat, go out in the river, and maybe try to write a song and come back in and put a demo down with a with a 2488 Tascam mixer, you know, just a analog, not analog, digital, but it's not Pro Tools or anything like that. I, I need stuff that's real easy to operate. You don't have to think too hard about it. Just push the button, record it, and get it done, you know. And uh, I'm, I'm from the school of you don't have to have a fully produced demo if you're a song man to hear that, you know what I mean? You can hear the guitar, just a guitar and vocal. If you've got a good song and there's a, really, a song person you're playing it for, uh, they can hear the song, you know. You don't have to spend $2,000 on a full band demo. You do it a lot to give it to the major companies a lot. You know, they want to hear they want to hear what it's going to sound like as a finished record. A lot of them. And so that's my plan: is just to have fun with music and uh, you know keep this place operating. But we have fun around here. You know, we have fun around here, and that's uh, we try to make sure that whoever's involved here, no bad vibes. You know, music can, can't take bad vibes. You know, of course, getting a good, good sound is, is, is utmost important. And a different one each time for each project, you know, searching for a, searching for a non-sane sounding, you know, situation. But it also become a part of, of the band as an engineer, you know. I mean, really work, you know, while, it's going, while, it's, while you're tracking, I mean, you really work work the thing, man, and be a part, become a part of that session, as opposed to just sitting back and getting it, you know, just recording it, you know. I mean, put yourself into the, and, you know, become a part of it, and you might, you might, you might, that might be all you need to do. You might have it at that point. I know, like, when, when we were cutting John Prime's Pink Cat out that album here, we, we asked our dad, not and I did, we asked dad to come in and, and uh, produced a couple of songs on the, on the album with us. We were running 16 tracks, and uh, but he was going to the two track. We did have a 16 track, but he was totally concentrating on the two track and his mix that he got at you know during the session there. That's that's what it was. I mean, he was playing the board. You know, he was playing the board, and that's a little different mentality than, than today, but. He was as much a part of that band as the drummer was or the guitar player was or anything. And he might make a move like add a little more echo just to, to guitar break solo right to the live, not go back and remix. But so he he was done with it after the two track. That was it. That was the master. So that's I don't know, man. I, I know I've gone around the world and back, but there's no there's no one answer that fits there's no one size fits all, you know. Just got to do what you feel like you got to do, but don't lay back and do nothing, you know. Be a part of it.
Well, I mean, of course, we got the Facebook pages, and we got the you know, my daughter maintains all that stuff, and I'm I'm uh, uh, not all that active on social media, you know. But it's a great thing, man. I mean, it's an awesome thing. But I would say just you know, keep in touch with the Sam Phillips. Uh, if you're talking about the studio, uh, you know, Facebook page and our website, and and pictures of what we're doing and who's been in here, and and uh, you'll kind of tell the story, you know, on the song. I'm just kind of floating through the universe, man, you know, these days and, and uh, picking and choosing what I want to do. And, and uh, uh, I've realized that life is short and uh, don't need to worry about too much. Just, just, just live your life, man, you know. It's just, that's really kind of where I'm at right now. <laughs>